five or eight. If we get to eight parts, uh, something has gone wrong. But uh, two parts anyway. The first part will be science. And we'll deal with this question up here, was ancient Mars Earthly? And I'll tell you a little bit about why I love Mars and why I think Mars is an important planet to study if we're to understand what's to happen to Earth and what has happened to Earth. And then uh, for the second part of the talk, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about a MAVEN, uh, a mission called MAVEN that's being sent to Mars later this year and how this spacecraft mission can give us information to help us uh, in our efforts to understand the answer to this question. So both of these planets that you see here are, of course, Mars. One is Mars as we see it today, which is just a beautiful planet. Uh, you can see all sorts of features on Mars. And as a matter of fact, I have a Mars globe here. Uh, but I'll go ahead and pass around, and I may pass it around a second time uh, during the talk after I um, and I give you a little bit more of an orientation. But for now, I'll just pass it around and ask you to look at it and try and notice some of the features on Mars and uh, what things you think are similar to Earth and what things you think are different from Earth today. The picture on the left is Mars as some people envision uh, it existed billions of years ago. So you can see it's the same planet. You have this big gash. Uh, in the face of the planet, a big canyon that's uh, seven miles deep in some places, and is the width of the United States, 4,000 miles across from side to side. Okay, so that much at least is similar between these two images. You can also see green in this image, and blue, and sunlight glinting off oceans on Mars. And there are scientists and uh, people who think that Mars was like this long ago, that it was much more Earth-like than it was today. So we'll discuss some of the evidence that suggests that this may have occurred. Uh, we'll discuss kinds of things that could have happened on Mars to change it from this Earth-like place to the Mars we know and love today. And we'll discuss how spacecraft measurements can bridge the gap between the two. First of all, why have humans always been so fascinated with Mars? As far as we know, humanity since it has existed, has been able to see Mars in our sky. Mars is one of seven objects that moves through our night sky relative to the background stars. Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Seven objects move relative to the background stars. And if you think about the names of those objects in English, but also in other languages, the significance of that number seven immediately becomes apparent. Saturn, Saturday. Moon, Monday. Anybody know what Tuesday is in Spanish or French? What did you say? Martes, Mars. You can do this for all seven days of the week. The seven days of the week are named for these seven objects that move among the background stars. Okay? And we gave these objects special significance because they weren't doing the expected things in the sky over the courses of, of months and years and seasons. Stars each night rise in the east, set in the west, and we can see certain stars at certain times of year. It's very repeatable. Planets are more complicated, and Mars especially. Uh, we have records that go back to the Greeks and possibly all the way back to the Egyptians that tell us that they could see Mars in their night sky. More recently, uh, within the past century or so, Mars really, within the past 150 years ago, 150 years or so, uh, Mars really seems to have captured our imagination uh, as a species. So a very famous uh, book by H.G. Wells called War of the Worlds was made into a radio program by Orson Welles called War of the Worlds. And people who tuned in to this fictional radio program uh, about uh, civilization from Mars attacking Earth didn't hear the disclaimer at the very beginning of the radio program that said that this was fiction. And people ran into the streets thinking that we were being terrorized by creatures from another planet. It was so believable. <coughs> Advertisements. Uh, were based uh, in part on the fact that Mars is peopled. There are humans walking around on Mars, and my 
uh, telescope at the University of Chicago, CU University of Chicago, at the Yerkes Observatory. Uh, observations that were being made there were being used to sell soap in 1893. Mars sells. <laughs> Edgar Rice Burroughs of Tarzan fame. Uh, his second most famous series was the John Carter series from Mars. Okay, A Princess of Mars is one book uh, in this very successful um, <coughs> series of novels at the time they were written. A much less successful movie uh, that came out in the past year or two, the John Carter movie. Um, not a terrible movie at all, but, but not nearly as successful as the books were uh, in their time. Uh, we've seen Mars appear, of course, in all sorts of, of literature ranging from uh, science fiction uh, through many, many different genres. Uh, the Martian Chronicles from Ray Beth Bradbury, uh, a very good science fiction trilogy, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, by Ken Stanley Robinson, uh, that came out in the 1990s, that it imagined uh, the first human colonists that uh, visited Mars and eventually established colonies and governments on Mars uh, themselves. But Mars, <coughs> Mars's fascination and attachment to us hasn't been limited to books. It appears in uh, video games, for example, the Doom video game, which is just a, a shoot em up video game that was popular in the late 90s and early 2000s, takes place on the surface of Mars and imagines various Martian creatures that, that they view as the hero of the game have to run around and destroy. Uh, <coughs> and movies, of course, we could go on and on and on for hours and hours and hours about the many different ways Mars has appeared in movies. Uh, <coughs> but but uh, I'll only mention two or three in this talk, so another one, of course, is Mars Attacks. Who else go ahead? Ah, Marvin the Martian. Uh, <laughs> who appeared in one of the very first images returned from the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars <laughs> as well. We had no idea uh, how he knew where it was going to land, but he was waiting. <laughs> so why are we so fascinated by Mars? As you're looking at it, as Mars goes around and the globe gets passed from person to person, you see features that remind you of home. And maybe not so much impact craters, although Earth does have impact craters, just not very many. But you'll see volcanoes on Mars. Mars has the biggest volcano in the solar system. You see canyons on Mars. You see polar caps on Mars. You can even, if you look closely, see cracks in the crust, tectonic features, things caused by the splitting of the crust and uh, certainly associated with earthquakes on Mars at the time that they formed. If you look very closely near the equator, as you spin it around, you can see things that look like channels where water flowed from south to north, sometimes out of impact craters, sometimes just from high regions to low regions. So Mars, I think, holds fascination for us because it reminds us of Earth when we look at it today. Mars is not the closest planet to Earth, by the way. Venus is the closest planet to Earth. Mars is just a little bit farther away from us than Venus is. So Mar we aren't so fascinated by Mars because it's so um, close. It's not the closest one. I think it's just how it looks. And it reminds us of where we walk around today. <coughs> now Mars has been studied scientifically as well, not just in, in, uh, picked up in popular culture, and sometimes successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully. Uh, or, well, no scientific endeavor is ever unsuccessful, um, <coughs> but with more or less degrees of correctness, I guess, in how you study Mars. So an Italian astronomer, uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli, uh, drew maps of Mars uh, that he observed through telescopes, and Schiaparelli noticed that these, there were regions of bright and dark, and he labeled some of these regions here canal. And Canali, um, <coughs> really is an Italian astronomer, and uh, Canali just basically means channels or lanes, and we're almost certain that he was just referring to the fact that there are dark bands on Mars interspersed with light bands when you look at it through a telescope. First of all, Lowell picked up this idea in the U.S. Uh, and read the word Canali, uh, almost certainly in Schiaparelli's maps, and imagined a whole civilization on Mars. Uh, that was taking water from the polar caps of Mars down to the arid equatorial regions so that they could farm. And this water was transported along canals. 
And the canals that uh, Lowell envisioned were almost certainly these canali that Schiaparelli drew. And uh, Lowell built the Lowell Observatory uh, in Arizona um, in large part to study and try and learn more about the Martian civilization. We can go back further in time, though. Johannes Kepler, one of my favorite scientists of all time, but the scientist who, discovered, uh, who, who basically discovered that the orbits of planets around the sun are ellipses. And this discovery really allowed us to transition from a mindset where Earth was the center of the solar system and the universe and everything went around Earth um, to a mindset where the sun is the center of the solar system and everything goes around the sun. It was Kepler's discovery that planetary orbits are not perfect circles but ellipses that allow this new model, which we now accept as the correct model, to work. And his uh, insight, his, his discovery of these elliptical orbits was based almost entirely on the position of Mars in the sky. He did not make these observations himself. He worked for a very great astronomer named Tycho Brahe, who was also really kind of an arrogant jerk. Uh, Tycho Brahe was from Denmark. When he was in his 20s, he got in a duel with another mathematician over who was the best at math. <laughs> Uh, I could just stop right there and have a good impression of Tycho Brahe. But uh, Tycho Brahe was also an amazing astronomer before the time of the telescope. His naked eye observations are widely accepted to be the best in the history of humankind. At the distance of your thumb extended outward from you, if you were to extend your thumb outward and go outside right now and look up at the sky and record the position of a star, uh, the position of the star that Tycho Brahe recorded was correct to within the width of his fingernail, using his naked eye. Amazing observations. Mars was only off by a little bit from where it should be if you assume that orbits are perfect circles. But Kepler so trusted Brahe's observations that the fact that Mars was off by half the thickness of his finger was enough to make him throw out that theory entirely and move to the elliptical orbit paradigm, which we now realize is correct. As a matter of fact, I maintain that it must be correct. Otherwise, all the spacecraft that we've sent to other planets uh, didn't get there. Kepler <laughs> went away. He came back. Before Kepler, Ptolemy <coughs> used um, observations of Mars to propose his own model of the solar system that was incorrect, but was so good that survived, that it survived for 2,000 years. He assumed that Earth was the center of the solar system, that everything went around Earth, including the sun, and that they did this in orbits that were perfect circles. Of course, <coughs> that's not a correct model, and things were off a little bit from where he predicted them to be, but Ptolemy was no dummy, and instead of throwing out his model, he just revised it. And instead of things going around Earth in perfect circles, he put little earrings on those perfect circles. And they have to go around the earrings as they go around the perfect circles. So they're doing this. I like the cotton eye joke. <laughs> and that worked. It worked just as well as any other model for 2,000 years. That model works so well that you can barely tell the difference between that model and the correct model over time scales of 40, 50, 60. It wasn't until Copernicus came along and was using 200-year-old tables that he realized that something was wrong with Ptolemy's model. We can go back even further, and I promise this is the last one. Uh, <coughs> Aristotle, in the ancient Greeks, used the position of Mars in the sky, and the fact that Mars moved relative to the stars, to propose the model where uh, Earth was the center of the solar system. There were other Greeks, Aristarchus, who had proposed that actually the sun is the center of the solar system. And Aristotle said, no, 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 no. Earth must be the center of the solar system, and everything must move in perfect circles. And I can <coughs> observe Mars moving in the sky, and I can make it fit my model. Turns out Aristotle was the tutor of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered every place at that time. And uh, Alexander the Great said, you know, whatever my tutor said uh, is correct. And everyone said, yes, sir. <laughs> and Aristotle's model <coughs> survived until Ptolemy revised it with his earrings. And that survived until Kepler threw all that out in favor of the elliptical models. All of this based on the position of Mars in the sky.
It's really affected how humanity and scientific thought has developed for thousands of years. <clears throat> now we move rapidly forward to the spacecraft era. Mars is the most visited planet in the solar system, uh, which right there tells you something about how fascinated we are with the planet. We, we keep sending spacecraft there. Uh, we don't have such a great batting average. But in recent times, our batting average has improved a lot in our success of arriving successfully at Mars. And we sent all sorts of missions. We sent orbiters, flybys, things that just go whizzing by and say, see Mars, I made my measurement, off I go. Those were pretty early on. And landers and rovers. <coughs> I'm not going to show you all of them, but just give you a sense of the many different missions. Early on in the 60s, the U.S. sent the Mariner missions to many different planets, including several to Mars. The University of Colorado was involved in those missions. The Soviets sent their missions that they creatively called Mars the missions. Uh, Viking landers landed in the 70s, around the time I was born. Mars Global Surveyor in the 1990s orbited Mars from the U.S. Pathfinder landed in the late 90s. Mars Odyssey is still orbiting there today and arrived in the late 90s and early uh, 2000s. The Spirit <coughs> Opportunity rover is just within the past few years. Uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter still orbiting today and returning data. Uh, and most recently, this past August, uh, Mars Curiosity, MSL, Mars Surface Lander, which was renamed Curiosity by a middle school student uh, as it was on its way to Mars. What a great thing uh, to say that you can play on Mars rover as a middle, middle school student. I mean, that would just be amazing. And uh, certainly motivate you to pursue a career in science or space exploration. And there are all sorts of things that I haven't shown up here. Mars has been well visited. And every time we visit, we learn something new. Every time we visit, we also announce that we discovered water on Mars. So maybe we learn something old as well. Uh, but it's just a fascinating place to go. We still don't know how Mars evolved, but we have ideas. So now let's talk about Mars today. What is Mars like if you were to go there right now? <coughs> First of all, it's always fun to look at pictures, so let's keep looking at those. This is my favorite picture of Mars. It's getting pretty old now. I think it's at least a decade old and probably 15 years or so. Uh, and it just sort of shows all the features of Mars that I know and love. And it does it in a way that to me is beautiful and makes Mars seem delicate. Uh, so you can see the surface of Mars and the modeled coloring, uh, the huge variation in colors from Mars. You can see that Mars has polar caps. Water has polar caps, lots and lots of water, covered with a thin veneer of carbon dioxide ice. And that's because the atmosphere of Mars is 95% carbon dioxide. Same stuff that comes out of your tailpipes. Not a great gas to be walking around and breathing if that's 95% of what's in the air. But it still looks beautiful, doesn't it? Uh, and you can see this <coughs> thin atmosphere that covers the planet. The atmosphere is really thin. Less than 1% the thickness of Earth's atmosphere. 7 tenths of 1%, or 7 millibars. And you can see volcanoes on Mars. Olympus Mons, the biggest volcano in the solar system, so tall, 21 kilometers uh, from its lowest point to its highest point, so tall that it pokes out above the clouds and atmosphere of Mars. In this picture taken from Hubble Space Telescope. So I just think this is beautiful. We can zoom in, and Olympus Mons, as I said, largest volcano in the solar system has basically six different parts to its caldera, where different eruptions have occurred over different periods of Martian history. Some of them maybe not that long ago, maybe 100 million years ago or something like that, which in geologic time is the blink of an eye. This uh, volcano is so big that it's roughly the size of the state of Arizona. It's a shield volcano, five degrees are the slope of its size, the same as the Hawaiian Islands. So you can walk up this with no problem whatsoever, except for these huge three-mile-high cliffs that surround it all the way around. There's so much mass in this volcano that it's put pressure on the surface of the planet locally, where all of this, basically, lava erupted and came out. It's put so much pressure 
but it, it's left a huge crack in the surface, the largest canyon in the solar system, Valles Marineris. Can you hear me? Because yeah. I wander. If you need me to stay here, the mic, I will. Yeah. It's hard. Okay. Valles Marineris, largest canyon in the solar system, about 4,000 miles across, <coughs> seven miles deep, <coughs> and we think basically the surface of Mars cracked from so much mass. Uh, from these volcanoes, not just Olympus Mons, but Flavonis Mons, Estrellas Mons, all of these other volcanoes that you're seeing as you pass Mars around. <coughs> Beautiful pictures. I could show you hours worth of just stunning pictures that I would love to hang on my wall of different features on Mars. And I'll just give you a sampling. Mars's surface has been shaped by wind. These are sand dunes <coughs> right here, and these are sand dunes right here. Okay. Some sand dunes on Mars are still active today. The wind in the atmosphere, even though it's very thin, can pick up dust and move it around, and the sand dunes will march forward in time. Other sand dunes are preserved, and they're on top of underlying rock where you can see impact craters, and they don't move. They, they froze years ago. Uh, we know this is an active process because we can also see dust devils scooting across the surface, leaving dark marks. Uh, and shadows <coughs> on, the, um, on the surface below. Some of these dust devils stick up miles and miles into the air, 10 kilometers, so six miles, I think, is the height of the largest dust devil, individual dust devil, that we've seen on Mars. Polar caps uh, also make for beautiful terrain. Right? Again, these are water ice with a thin veneer of carbon dioxide. The fact that they're up near the poles, so the sun hits them at a glancing angle at different times of year, here, creates for all sorts of interesting terrain, where you have high ice and low ice that basically looks like Swiss cheese, and it's called Swiss cheese terrain by the scientists. Uh, you also have polar ice that's called brain terrain. <laughs> I had to show it, okay. Uh, and we were talking about this at dinner. Those dust devils, Mars has extreme seasons, so those dust devils can grow and grow and grow, especially in southern hemisphere summer, to the point where the dust devils are not local, but they're global dust storms. And the dust stays in the air. This is a photograph, not a photograph, but a, a telescope image from Hubble of Mars, of dust in the atmosphere so thick that you can't see the surface anymore. Again, this will last for weeks, sometimes a month or two in southern summer at Mars. We have images from the surface, of course, looks like Arizona or New Mexico. Um, we even have images from the Viking era, and more recently, of frost on the Martian surface. There is uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that will condense out as frost, and there is water, a little tiny bit of water in the atmosphere that can condense out, but you can get frost on the surface of Mars. We have more recent images from rovers uh, that show very interesting geological uh, structures. Uh, this is a, a longer crater rim, and if you can see this, you can see sort of stripes in the rock. These stripes are, are reminiscent of uh, sedimentary layers, things that were laid down in the presence of standing liquid water at Mars. There's no standing liquid water there today. The atmosphere won't support it. Okay, but this suggests that there was water there long ago. And then this is also another beautiful image from a rover uh, of a pretty dusty and rock-free type desert terrain. And then the Martian sky. There's a lot of <coughs> discussion and debate about the true color of the Martian sky. It's really hard actually to figure out. Um, but the idea is that it's generally redder than our sky and can have tinges of blue and pink and things like that. And you can see swirling clouds go through the sky as well. Sunset must be wonderful. And then most recently, the Curiosity rover that landed this past August landed in the middle of a crater called Gale Crater. Gale Crater has a mountain in the middle of the crater that's called Mount Sharp, after a geologist named Robert Sharp from Australia. Uh, Curiosity, its mission, and it chose to accept it, is to drive up Mount Sharp as far as it can get. And the reason that it's going to do this is because the rocks that are at the bottom seem to be different from the rocks that are at the top, at least uh, based on what we can tell from orbit. Not only how they look, but what their composition is. 
And so we think that by driving up this mountain, curiosity can sample many different epochs in Martian history going back billions of years. So what did they do when they landed there? They landed there, they looked completely the other direction, they saw something really cool, and they drove that way instead. <laughs> so, uh, right now, they're over here someplace, and they're turning around, and they're slowly heading back, but it's a whole committee of scientists saying, I want to look at that rock, I want to look at that rock, I want to look at that rock, so it might take some kind of a long time to get back. Uh, and as they drive through the soil, this is really amazing. You can see the tracks, of course, in the soil. And this is uh, so nerdy, it's cool. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who made the wheels for the rover, decided to put Braille on the wheels. And the Braille spells out JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So if you read Braille, you can see JPL, 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 which just sounds awesome. But it has a purpose, too. We know the circumference of the wheel. So by looking at the number of JPLs between here and here, you have an independent measure of how far you drove. So it's not so nerdy, it's smart also. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Martian atmosphere. We haven't talked too much about that. It's cold, it's toxic, and it's thin. Not a fun place to be if you're a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout on the surface of Mars. Cold you can handle, although you might be about as grumpy as this molten penguin right here. Uh, on the warmest of summer days, Mars gets up to freezing. The average temperature is about 60 degrees below freezing, about 210 Kelvin. So 63 degrees below freezing. And that's the average temperature, so it gets colder than that. But you can bring space suits, and that be okay. Um, it's toxic, 95% carbon dioxide. Don't take your helmet off, and don't run out of oxygen while you're there. And it's thin, seven mil bars, seven one thousandths the thickness of Earth's atmosphere. Really, really thin. If you were to wave your hand through the air like we can do on Earth and feel the air pushing against your hand, imagine your hand pushing against something seven one thousandths the thickness of the air here. You would barely feel that at all. It might be roughly equivalent to uh, moving your hand through a uh, swimming pool full of water and then getting out and doing it on the deck. I think that's about the difference um, that might be apparent to you if you did that. So the Martian atmosphere today is not a very nice place to be. Was it any different in the past? Ah, sorry. Are there any young people here? Any, okay. That was an image from Total Recall. When you combine cold, toxic, thin, you end up looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger on the surface of Mars and Total Recall with your eyes bulging out. Okay, Mars long ago might have been very different. There are riverbeds on the surface of Mars. Dry, but they're there. And they have this dendritic branching pattern as you go from high elevations to low. This means water, any water on the surface of Mars, flowed downhill and it joined up with other water flowing downhill from other places, and we made a bigger channel. Then joined up with water flowing downhill from over here, and finally into a big river channel down at the bottom. We see the same stuff on Earth. <coughs> we can look at individual river channels, and we can see oxbow ends, places where the river channel changed course over time. We can see it twisting and turning, where some fluid flowed through. We can see evidence where the river turned off and on again. There's a big, large channel, and then there's a smaller one the size inside of it. Multiple episodes of uh, river water motion on Mars. River deltas, just like Louisiana and the Mississippi River, there's all sorts of silt and soil and sand in the water that gets swept uh, down and then basically dropped uh, in New Orleans. In the Louisiana Delta region, we see evidence for river deltas on Mars. There's a river channel over here, and you can see this accumulation of soil and sand and silt right at the mouth of the river channel. This was carried downstream. This is the Everswell Deep Delta, a very famous one. Again, uh, uh, sedimentary layers of the rocks, as seen by rovers, suggest that water has played an important role on the surface of Mars. We can look at impact craters, but this impact crater doesn't look like the normal bowl-shaped bowl impact crater. Its rim is really eroded. 
It's basically been flattened over time. The best thing we know of to erode the rim of a crater is a big, thick atmosphere. That's exactly what does it at Earth, and it's what, what makes it so hard to find impact craters on Earth. There may be a hundred that we know of on the entire planet, whereas there are thousands on Mars. Hundreds of thousands. Again, sedimentary layers from space where you can see this scalloped rain where stuff has been laid down and standing liquid water over uh, periods of time. More. Uh, there are crater rims and there are these things called gullies on both cliffs and the sides of craters where it looks like water has come out from the subsurface and drizzled down the side. And then you can see deposits in the bottom of the crater as well. We see these changing today. We can see new gullies form every year when we look at Mars. There's still water inside of Mars that comes leaking out annually and flows downhill. It just doesn't stay there anymore because the atmosphere can't support liquid water at the surface. More bubbles. And you can see them coming down the sides. <coughs> when we get up close to rocks, we also see very interesting things that we call blueberries, okay, less than a centimeter across. And they're all over the place. I know it's hard to see, but every one of these little blue dots is one of these little spheres. Okay, we see these on Earth as well, and they're formed in standing liquid water. They're usually made of something called hematite, uh, and we see them uh, in at least two of the sites that rovers have visited in Mars so far. You need liquid water to form these. Here's some more blueberries as well, all over the place. Also, from orbit, <coughs> we can look down at the surface and not just take pictures, but look at the different wavelengths of light coming back to us, and that tells us something about the surface composition of Mars. And you don't really need to see the details of this picture, you just need to see the splashes of color. And know that the splashes of color correspond to phyllosilicates. These are rocks with silicate in them, but they require liquid water to form on Earth. Liquid water has been present on Mars. And finally, most recently, the Curiosity rover that you know, went the wrong way, but it's really cool. This is one of the really cool things that they saw. These rocks with these grooves and striations in them, not only are there grooves and striations as if something has been in place in liquid water, they're also cross-cutting grooves, as if there were changes in flow direction, things like that. A very interesting rock to think of. So, was Mars long ago like this? There was liquid water all over the place, clearly changing the surface what was the atmosphere like? If there was liquid water there long enough to form rivers and lakes, the atmosphere must have been capable of supporting that liquid water. And the atmosphere is not capable of that today. What happened? What changed? Oh, this is totally extra just because it's fun to look at pictures. Uh, sorry. Uh, Earth, Mars. And look, they look kind of the same. Um, here, is uh, on Maui, uh, near one of the volcanoes on Maui, up, up near Haleakala. You can see the terrain here, all sorts of red rocks and boulders. Here's Mars, it looks the same. You can take any number of pictures on Earth in any number of locations to get something that looks the same. Dunes, as I said before, this is just an excuse to show another dune picture. It's so beautiful on Mars. Look at these dunes, all over the place. And here's great sand dunes right here. Same sort of ripple structure in the dune, different scale, but same process, wind pushing sand around. Dust devils on Earth, just extending up into the air as it scoots across, and here's another one over here. Here's a dust devil that went by one of the rovers on Mars. We've gotten three in a single frame before. Here again are the dendritic river channels on Mars. And I just took an Earth image of a river system and turned it into black and white. Okay, if I had flip-flopped these, uh, one, one next to the other, you'd be hard-pressed to tell that this was Mars, except for the impact crater up here. Deltas again, like I said, on Mars. Here's a river delta on Mars, Ever's Wally. Here's a river delta on it. Same sort of broccoli, kale type shape. Sedimentary layers on Earth like a big stack of flapjacks, sedimentary layers on Mars. 
and just because it's fun. An image of a dust devil speeding across the surface of Mars. This is about nine minutes of video right here. So images were taken, I think, 30 seconds apart or something like that. You can see the dust devil speeding across. Mars is totally fun. All right. Hopefully I've convinced you that something changed on Mars, that there used to be a big, thick atmosphere capable of supporting liquid water. Where did that atmosphere go? <laughs> well, it turns out there's two answers to the question. Up or down? If you don't go one of those two places, you're still in the atmosphere. So we can rule that one out. And we know that both have happened at Mars. We have evidence from spacecraft for hydrogen buried just underneath the surface. Hydrogen underneath the surface, its most likely form is in water ice. Okay, and this is globally distributed. There's lots of water underneath the surface. It could have been formerly on the surface and come down. We also know that up has happened. The particles that were in the atmosphere have escaped away to space. We see this happening today. And we have evidence from the gases in the atmosphere and the ratios in which they occur that suggest that the lighter gases have been removed preferentially from the atmosphere. But one way for lighter gases to be removed preferentially is off the top. And that's because at the top of the atmosphere, the lighter gases are more abundant, the heavier gases sink. So if, we're, if you're missing lots of light gas, the number one culprit is removing things away at the top. We know that both have happened at Mars. The big debate in the scientific community is how important is this one versus that one? And we really don't have the answer to that question. And so that's where the spacecraft mission comes in. Where did the water go? Did it go, in? did it go into the crust and form carbonate rocks, like limestone uh, is formed on Earth? Or did it escape to space? Here's Mars right here. And these are measurements made by orbiting spacecraft of the location of atmospheric particles behind Mars, with the sun over here to the right. You can measure these atmospheric particles as they escape. We just don't have very good measurements right now. Where did the water go? And also, where did the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere go? If you have a big, thick atmosphere that's 95% carbon dioxide, you probably have lost a lot of that, too. And carbon dioxide is a very good greenhouse gas. It's good at keeping the surface warm. So we probably lost both water and carbon dioxide to space. So the overarching question and the reason that people care about this is, does Mars, did Mars ever have life? Are we alone on Earth? Did life develop anywhere else? And where are the good places to look? Mars seemingly had liquid water in the past. It was seemingly warm. There's all sorts of food for critters there. It's a great place to go looking for evidence of life. It met all of these requirements, liquid water, access to biogenic elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Those are the biogenic elements. Those are food for all life on Earth in some combination. Add a source of energy to drive life, to keep it going. So did Mars ever have life? How did any life interact with its planetary environment? And how has the habitability of Mars changed over time? This question was sort of brought to the front uh, brought to the fore very publicly about a decade ago with the discovery of a meteorite in the Antarctica that fell from the skies. The gases inside the meteorite uh, tell us that the meteorite came from Mars. The ratios of gases inside that meteorite exactly match the ratios of gases in the Martian atmosphere. And when you break it open, you see all sorts of suggestive signatures. Most of this has now been accepted as not evidence of life by the bulk of the scientific community. But this certainly re-energized the idea of looking for life on Mars. So in comes the spacecraft mission. And the mission that we're involved with at the University of Colorado, and I'll spend the rest of the time telling you about briefly and showing you pretty pictures uh, of how it's going together because it's really exciting. <coughs> the spacecraft is called Maven. You can see Mars today and Mars as it might have looked in the past. This is what the spacecraft would look like. What does Maven mean? It's an acronym. It stands for Mars, that's good, Atmosphere, that's good, and Volatile, that just means the uh, species in the atmosphere that can evaporate easily and turn into gas, that are easy to mobilize. So Mars, Atmosphere, and Volatile, that's good. Evolution, 
<laughs> so that's Maven. There it is. Uh, and it's being led on the laboratory drive so it's physics, blah, 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 at the University of Colorado, uh, which is uh, where I'm from, um, professionally speaking. And so I can tell you a little bit about um, how the spacecraft got its start, but I'll just abbreviate that now and see if that question if it comes up. It's a result of a competition. NASA didn't decide they were sending the spacecraft. They said, hey, community, we're sending a spacecraft to Mars. Here's a pot of money. Give us some proposals for what you'd like to do. And there are about 20 applicants, and ours is the one that won. So I'm really excited. What will they even do? This is hopefully reviewed by now. The atmosphere is cold and dry today. There was one slip of water flowing over the surface. Where did the water in early atmosphere go? Well, it go into the crust would be lost to space. Maven focuses on the ups, the loss to space. And in our opinion, of the ups and the downs, the greatest uncertainty lies with the ups. The most unknowns lie with the ups. The things that we most need to take measurements to help us understand Mars lie with the ups. And that's where we desperately need measurements, so that's what we propose to do. And the idea is that well, Mars used to have a big magnetic field. There's Mars here, and you can barely see these magnetic field lines. But a magnetic field protects the planet's atmosphere from all of this radiation coming from the sun. Not sunlight. That's good. Uh, in just the right quantity. Uh, but all these particles that the sun is shooting out at 400 kilometers per second. Protons and electrons. It's like having a huge, enormous hair dryer pointed at a planet and not having, and, and your planet is sort of cotton candy or something like that, and not having a plexiglass dome to protect you from the hair dryer. If you take that plexiglass dome away, suddenly your cotton candy starts leaving. And now I'm hungry. But when that magnetic field goes away, then you can see the atmosphere uh, start to, to leave Mars. And we think that this has happened over billions of years on the planet. So what we'll maybe do, we have three science questions. When you propose to NASA, you have to have science questions. And we have three big ones. And then each big one is broken up into little ones. And then all the little ones are connected to the instruments that go on the spacecraft. And then someone comes along and says, yes, 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 yes. This all makes sense. You win. And so that's what happened. Our three big science questions are, determine the structure and composition of the Martian upper atmosphere today. The upper atmosphere is where the particles are leaving from. And that's the part of the atmosphere we understand so poorly. Number two, determine <coughs> the rates of loss of gas to space today. Number three is the tricky one, is use all of these measurements from today to figure out what Mars was doing over the past four billion years. And I admit that that's a very hard thing to do, but we think that we're going to be able to do it. And here's why. The sun shines on Mars sometimes brightly, sometimes a little less brightly, today. The sun shoots particles at Mars, um, sometimes lots of them, sometimes relatively few of them, today. By understanding how the Martian atmosphere responds uh, uh, among all of these changes in the input conditions, we have leverage to extrapolate back in time over Martian history when we think the input condition is very different. So that's how we're going to go about making our measurements. So this is what I just said, and this diagram is horrible. And I am allowed to say that because I made this diagram for the proposal, and I now hate it. But it has all the stuff in there. So here's Mars, and Mars has an atmosphere that's blue of neutral particles. It also has parts of its atmosphere that are charged, charged particles. So those are kind of pinkish. And we want to study all parts of the atmosphere and the many different ways that atmosphere can leave. It can leave as neutral particles, different ways, and we have terms for the different ways it can leave. It can leave as charged particles, and that's so much more fun, because we get to do a little dance as they leave. Uh, and they can come out of these crustal magnetic field regions, and aurora on Mars, and all of this is driven by the sun. Not just sunlight, which we call EUV for extreme ultraviolet, but also the particles coming from the sun, solar wind, storms, solar storms, CMEs, or coronal mass ejections. 
and the particles of those storms create SEPs, solar energetic particles. All of these things come crashing into the Martian system, sometimes along magnetic field lines, and they strip particles away. They strip that cotton candy atmosphere away. And so we're studying on one spacecraft, all at the same time, all of these different things. So even though I said we already know that the atmosphere is escaping, we haven't had the measurements to correlate this escape with these drivers before. And so that's what Maven will do. We have science instruments. It's like each individual science experiment on the spacecraft. <coughs> we have eight science instruments, and then we use the spacecraft itself as a ninth science instrument. The spacecraft skims through the top of the atmosphere, but the atmosphere is made of particles. And so when the atmosphere is more dense, there's more drag on the spacecraft. And so by measuring the spacecraft drag, we can also learn about the density of the atmosphere. That's the ninth instrument. Two of the instruments are built at CU. Uh, four of the instruments are built at Berkeley, where I used to be before I moved to CU. And two of them are built at Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. This one is especially interesting because this investigator, Paul Mahaffey, Paul Mahaffey at Goddard, is the same investigator who put an instrument on the Curiosity rover that's right now at the bottom of the Martian atmosphere. These instruments are very similar, and they tell us about the composition of the atmosphere in different species. So we're going to have measurements basically from the same instrument at the bottom and top of the atmosphere at the same time, which should be incredibly powerful. Here's the spacecraft. If you care about how heavy it is, I'm sorry, I don't, but there it is. Um, it's heavy. There you go. But I care about all the science instruments, and they're all in cool different places on corners of the spacecraft, sometimes out on the ends of solar panels. This thing right here, the Langer probe with waves, these two antenna tell us something about the charged particles in the upper atmosphere. And there's this thing down here called the articulated payload platform. It's basically this platform that hangs down like an elephant's trunk, and it has um, two gimbals on it. And there are three instruments at the end of this platform. And so by the gimbals turning, you can put different instruments in different orientations. And if the spacecraft moves this way, and you want to collect neutral particles, you put that instrument uh, in the spacecraft random direction. If you want to take ultraviolet uh, measurements of the planet when you're far away, you uh, uh, move those gimbals accordingly. So that's pretty cool as well. <coughs> How big is it? It's the same way fully loaded as a GMC Yukon, about 5,600 pounds or 2,550 kilograms. Same length tip to tip as a school bus, 37 feet. We launched the week before Thanksgiving of this year, uh, Monday, November 18th, but it's a launch window of about three weeks. We, we have enough fuel on the spacecraft that we have a three week launch window that will allow us to get from Earth orbit out to Mars orbit in roughly a nine or 10 month period, this cruise period. We'll insert into orbit in September of 2014 after that cruise. We'll take about a month to turn the instruments on, check them out, make sure they're working. And then we get one Earth year of science operations. <coughs> one Earth year is half of a Mars year. But we have enough fuel on board to last until about 2025. And so we have hope for an extended mission as well. Ah. Um, we have a neat orbit. <laughs> Here's Mars. The sun's over here. These colors tell you all the interesting regions that you want to measure. And the white are all the places that the spacecraft orbit will visit. We'll visit all the cool places. Here's a sample orbit. And different instruments are in charge of the spacecraft during different parts of the orbit. That's the takeaway point here. When we're far from Mars, the ultraviolet instrument built at the University of Colorado is in charge of the spacecraft. All the other instruments can make measurements, but this guy gets to say what happens. And it mostly wants to take measurements of the composition and temperature of the upper atmosphere on the base side. When we get really close, all the instruments that collect particles, rather than just taking sort of images, they're in charge. And they collect as we skim through the upper atmosphere and tell us what that atmosphere is made of. And here on the sides, uh, other instruments get to be in charge, too, in these interesting regions near Mars. The sun changes on 11-year time scale, and we want to use as much of that change as possible to help us learn about the response of the Martian atmosphere. We're going to be in this declining phase of the solar cycle. 
Uh, we would have liked to have been at solar max, but this is acceptable to us because most of the good storms, most of the big solar storms happen right in that phase. And then determining the total atmospheric loss through time, it should be twinkling at some point, who knows. Uh, this is the idea. We'll take the history of what we think our star was like, our sun was like over the last four billion years. We have a good idea of what that history is by studying other stars that are like our sun elsewhere in the galaxy. Okay, we'll take um, uh, measurements from MAVEN of the ratios of gases in the atmosphere and measurements and models uh, created from MAVEN data and we'll put all this together to give us an idea of what the atmosphere has been like through time. Here's today with not very much atmospheric loss. But as we move back in time, we know that our sun was more active, the solar wind was more robust, there were more solar storms, and so it's likely atmospheric loss was much more vigorous early in Martian history. Okay, here are the pretty pictures uh, part. Uh, putting a spacecraft mission together is a lot of fun and a lot of work. One thing that's asked you to do is review everything in front of an independent panel. So this is a review panel. These people are not on the native team. And they're listening intently, intently, at least one person is, uh, to the presentation being given by a Maven team member over here. This gentleman right here has obviously attended many reviews. <laughs> <coughs> and the spacecraft's going together at Lockheed Martin right now. This is a cool picture of sort of the shell of the Maven spacecraft without anything having been put on it yet. Okay, now uh, the Maven spacecraft is in ATMO, assembly, test, and launch operations. And so you start putting stuff on. Okay, you put the uh, fuel tanks on, antenna on, solar panels on, and of course the science instruments on as well. Uh, all the computers that help you drive the spacecraft and talk to Earth. Um, so here's integration of the core with the fuel tank. Okay, and then you have to lift things and move things around. And every time you do that, you have to wear a bunny suit to keep the spacecraft clean. Okay, all the payload hardware has been built. All but two of the instruments have been put on the spacecraft so far. So we're getting close to the end here of assembly of the spacecraft. These are pretty recent pictures. Here's the spacecraft structure. And now the high gain antenna has been put on to the spacecraft. So we're now from talk going home to Earth. Um, it's hard to make out what this is, except now everything is labeled. And so here, uh, this is a relay. Uh, and not only will we make our own observations, but we're carrying a relay for the rovers on Mars right now, so they can relay their information through us and back home. That's what the electric is. And all the different instruments, uh, except for two right now, but all that you see here have been put onto the spacecraft and are in the process of being tested on the spacecraft body. This was taken last week, so now we have solar panels on the spacecraft. We have a high gain antenna there, instruments. This is a magnetometer that measures magnetic fields. It's out all the way on the end of the solar panels to get you as far away from the magnetic fields um, uh, that are generated on the spacecraft itself. We want to measure magnetic fields from Mars, not magnetic fields from our own spacecraft. This is a really cool test that was done. The scientists asked that this test be done, and the people at Lockheed Martin said, no, thank you. And the scientist said, yes, please. And the people at Lockheed said, no, thank you. And this went on for years. And then these are the people from Lockheed Martin kind of shaking their heads, saying, I can't believe we're doing this. Uh, but we suspended the spacecraft from the ceiling. We turned on the magnetic field instrument. And we gave the spacecraft a push. And then we stepped back. And we watched it swing back and forth. The reason that we do that is as the magnetic field instrument swings back and forth through Earth's magnetic field, that allows us to calibrate that magnetic field instrument and make sure that it's working properly. It's called a swing test. And they hate it. <laughs> okay, we're going to launch from Florida in November, and I promise I'm wrapping up here in just a few minutes. Um, these are just sort of family photos that are probably more interesting to me at this point than other people, but we're going to launch from Florida. Here's our launch site for November. Uh, we're going to launch off an Atlas V rocket. The name is, this has been photoshopped on, by the way. Um, but this is an actual Atlas V rocket. The Maven spacecraft sits in the fairing right here. The rest of this rocket is fuel. Okay? Together. 
lots and lots of people, and this is a small fraction of the people that have worked on Maven. Uh, the lead uh, on Maven is Bruce Joukowsky. He's a geology professor at the University of Colorado. But it takes a huge number of people to get a spacecraft project working uh, properly. And it's really a great team. And it's the first project I've been involved with from start to finish in my career. Uh, so that's been exciting for me. Science operations will happen at the University of Colorado. We have our own little mission operations center. Uh, we can control spacecraft in this center, and we do. Uh, and our science data center will be there at the University of Colorado. The main mission control center will be at Lockheed Martin in Denver. <coughs> we have an education and public outreach program, of which Tom is uh, a major part. Tom does tons of things, but among them, I know he maintains the Maven webpage, the Maven blog entries, the Maven Facebook page, and all the Maven Facebook posts come from Tom. Uh, over there, and he's just one of the EPO team. Uh, uh, we're heavily involved in various social media, uh, in getting school groups and teacher visits in, and uh, uh, even journalist workshops and things like that. Here's our schedule. Uh, it's February 13th, 2013, and this is just sort of major milestones in the project. We've passed all of our major, major milestones so far. We are on or ahead of budget. We are on schedule. Everything's going well. Uh, <coughs> this all started in 2003, early 2004, before my seven-year-old son was born, is how long I've been involved with this. We submitted the proposal in 2006. We were selected as one of two proposals in 2007, and we had to compete against each other. We were given a million dollars in one year and said go, and one of us was judged to be the winner, and it was us. Uh, and so we were selected in September 2008, which was a great day, or month, I guess. Uh, we were confirmed, which is a major milestone confirmation in 2010. That basically means that it's very hard for us not to go at this point. And as of today, we're 278 days away from launch, less than a year. So Maven's on track, it's on schedule, on budget. Here's some URLs, and I just have two or three slides left, and I'll go back to those. Maven fits into a larger picture of Mars exploration. Here's Maven right here in 2013. And the launch windows to Mars that allow you to use the least amount of fuel open every two years. Okay? Mars Science Lab Curiosity was launched in uh, 2011. InSight will be studying the interior of Mars. will be launched in 2016. They're talking about another rover in 2020 and beyond. And here are all the currently active Mars spacecraft, although Phoenix is no longer currently back. Maven fits into the NASA theme of follow the water, and hopefully I've made a good case about why that's important and why we think that's interesting. So I'll just skip right past and leave you with these last two slides. Um, was ancient Mars Earth? -like? I don't know, but I would really like to find out. I mean, I think it's absolutely beautiful to look at Earth today. From space. I think it's beautiful to look at Mars today from space, but I think it's, to be honest, just really fun uh, to think about whether Mars will look like this. <laughs> if it did, look at the similarities. That's just amazing. This is everything I've said. Uh, but I'll leave it up there. And you can't give a talk on February 13th without showing the heart shape. Thanks very much.